And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Thelmar Persico, who is a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and teaches at Tel Aviv University. His field of study are contemporary spiritualities, uh, Jewish, Jewish renewal and secularization in Israel. His book about the Jewish meditation tradition was published a year ago, and he's also an activist of freedom of religion in Israel and writes the most popular blog in Hebrew uh, on religion and has written hundreds of articles on this subject of, for popular media. Thank so you, Maria. So we're about the Temple Mount. Yes. Uh, I will talk about the Temple Mount, about changing conceptions of holiness uh, at the Temple Mount. Uh, and I will start with this, with the uh, formal denouncement of any Jewish ascension to the Temple Mount. This is, a, this is a, 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 a decree issued by the chief rabbinate of Israel, sometimes at the beginning of the 1920s, issued by uh, Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak Cohen Cook, the first chief rabbi of Israel. And uh, it's quite, uh, you, you can read it in English also, a public warning uh, by His Excellency, uh, eminence, the chief rabbi of Eretz Israel, Avraham Yitzchak Cook, our dear, what is brothers who came from far and near to the holy city of Jerusalem, be warned and remember that it is strictly forbidden by Jewish law and religion to enter the temple area, Haram and Sharif, or to ascend the Har Habayit. Not only to enter the temple area, but also to ascend the mount. It is strictly forbidden, and indeed I will not uh, burden you with names, but all the great halachic rabbis of the last 100, maybe 200 years have decreed that ascension to the Temple Mount is strictly forbidden. Every one of the big names. Um, and why? Why is it uh, forbidden? I brought you uh, some quotes from uh, uh, major halachic uh, figures. Maimonides says, even though the temple now is in ruin because of our sins, a person must hold its sight in awe as one would regard it when it was standing. So, of course, we don't have the temple now, and when there was a temple, you could not just waltz in there. There were certain sections for different uh, uh, um, uh, sections of the populations. Priests could go into certain, uh, uh, farther in, and the high priest could go to the uh, Holy of Holies. And then we have the Chafetz uh, Chaim, Rabbi Meir Cohen of Radin, says, uh, one who enters now into the place of temple sins a mortal sin, karet, as we are all defiled by the defilement of death. So this is the formal halachic reason. We are all defiled by the defilement of death, meaning we have all either touched a dead body or have uh, been with a dead body in the same building, assumingly a hospital. If anyone of us were born in a hospital, someone died in the same building, or we have stepped over a body even without knowing it, maybe a body two yards deep in the ground. So that means we are all defiled by the defilement of death and we cannot go up the temp into the grounds of the temple. But why not up the temple mount? I will, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll show you now. I, I, these are diagrams of the temple mount and the second Temple of Israel. As you can see, the Temple Mount is much bigger than the Temple. The Temple indeed can be fit into the Temple Mount about four or five times. So maybe we can go up the Mount, but not into where the Temple had stood. But, says Rabbi Shlomo Aviner, a contemporary rabbi, I have no, uh, so he's asked, what is the opinion of the rabbi in relation to assembling the Temple Mount? And he says, I have no personal opinion. My personal opinion does not count. It's a question of greater Israel, which is decided by our great rabbis. And indeed, almost all the great rabbis, ultra-Orthodox and religious Zionists, prohibit it. Why? Now, here is an halachic explanation uh, that you heard part of it. By this description, a person will be allowed to enter the Temple Mount, except the Ezra and the Chayil, two spaces around the temple. The problem is we do not know where exactly is the Ezra and the Chayil. 
There are so many measurements set on the basis of the place of the western wall, the southern wall, the foundation stone, etc. There, there are different methods that contradict each other. So in fact, everything is shrouded in mystery. Therefore, the ancient custom of Jerusalem is that we do not enter. So we can't ascend the Temple Mount wholly at all because we don't know where exactly the Temple fit inside there. That's the halachic formal explanation. But I want to suggest to you that there is another explanation, a deeper, uh, a deeper uh, explanation which, which connects to an attitude, to a sentiment, to a definition of the holy. And this, this attitude looks at the sacred as the forbidden. What is holy is out of bounds. That's the very definition of it. And I brought here a quote from uh, Rabbi Tzvitao. And he talks uh, uh, at the beginning of the 80s after the Jewish underground, quote unquote, was discovered by our secret service and uh, detained. Uh, and, and some of these, this group of people, some of them murdered some Palestinians. Others uh, wanted to blow up the, temp the, the Dome of the Rock. So uh, Rabbi Tao says, where God is concerned, closeness is achieved by distance. And it is also true in these matters. We do not reveal our ownership of the Temple Mount by actually stepping there. Contrarily, our ownership is manifested by the fact, this is my emphasis, of course, that the Gentiles are stepping there and we are not. It is a central point in our faith to distinguish between the people of Israel worthy of the Temple and the people of Israel today. Those who fail to see this decrease the matter and reduce it to the level of kindergarten. The Temple Mount is not a private matter for leaping ahead, a sort of avant-garde of pioneers that lead the way. The Temple Mount is not intended for pioneers with mud on their boots. So this is the attitude. The attitude is what is holy is forbidden. What is holy is uh, further, further off. And indeed, we have a nice definition by Emil Durkheim uh, uh, in, in his classic, The Elementary Form of Religious Life. Who Here he defines religion, but also what is the sacred, what is holy. A religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices rel relative to sacred things. That is to say, things set apart and forbidden. Beliefs and practices which unite into a single moral community called the church, all those who adhere to them. What is the holy? The holy is, thing, is what is set apart and what is forbidden. And indeed, any Hebrew speaker here should know that kadosh, holy in Hebrew, doesn't mean saint, but means special, set apart. When a man says, when a groom says to the bride, hareyat mekudeshet li, by that very act he marries her, but the wording means you are set apart for me. You are my special one, not you are my saint. He uses the word kadosh. And I won't go into that too much, but this is the basic classic meaning of holy in the Jewish tradition. And indeed, we can see that Harav Tau knows that. But something has happened. Something has happened to the way Israelis, and especially religious Zionists, view the Temple Mount and view the holiness of the Temple Mount. This is a quote from Rabbi Menachem Fruman uh, in January 1991. This is, a, 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 I'm, I'm telling, uh, this is again the former attitude, the one Rabbi Tzvitao just now uh, we saw uh, mentioning. So Fruman, in January 1991, publishes in Haaretz an op-ed in which he, it's a sort of an open letter for the Palestinians in which he says, he says to the Palestinians, look, I know we have some dispute about the settlements. You don't like the settlements. I do like the settlements. Okay. But know this, about the Temple Mount, there is no argument between us. The Temple Mount is, is off bounds for us. So you don't have to worry about that. And he said, look what he says. The national religious publics, Harav Cook's disciples, concept consists of two very forceful elements. A very realistic, materializing one, the actual settlement of the entire Eretz Israel, land of Israel. And the messianic spiritual one, 
objection to entering the Temple Mount. The Messianic element is perceived from an orthodox point of view, waiting silently for the Messiah, not creating a false Messiah by our, by our own hands. This is again my emphasis. The holiness of the Temple Mount is expressed not by barging into it, but rather by withdrawing from it. And this is exactly the attitude that we saw so far. But again, something has changed. And the, and the first sign of change came in 96, beginning of 96. This is a decree, a halachic decree, issued by the Yesha Rabbinical <laughs> Council, Mo'etzot Rabbanim Shel Yesha. And they, in February 96, say, we call any rabbi who holds that the ascent to the Temple Mount is allowed to ascend himself and to instruct his congregation how to ascend according to the halakha. For it is a disgrace to us that the Arabs, that the Arabs say, let us take possession of the pure pasture lands of God. They ascend in tens of thousands while we do not ascend even one of a city and two from a family. This is a Talmudic uh, quote. So this is the first time a, a prominent rabbis issued a decree that allows Jews to ascend the Temple Mount. Now, the decree is issued and the explanation is right there. Why do they allow people to ascend the Temple Mount? Obviously, because Arabs are there. Something is happening. Now, Arabs were there for the last 1,300 years, right? Muslims who pray at the Temple Mount. So what exactly has changed. Well, this is 96. This is after Prime Minister Rabin assassination, but the Oslo process is still high, high, well, well uh, uh, ahead. Uh, this, at February 96, Shimon Peres is the Prime Minister. Soon Netanyahu will be elected for his first government, but still the Oslo process is very much alive. And they, I would say, are fearful that soon the negotiations will uh, include Jerusalem and the splitting up of Jerusalem and uh, naturally some sort of compromise around the Temple Mount. So they want to, uh, to uh, uh, assert their dominance over that place. So this is the first sign of change. Still, until the 2000s, until the end of the first decade of the, two, of, the, of the 2000s, not many religious Zionists went up the Temple Mount, and it was a very peripheral uh, phenomenon. But today it's not the case. This is, from, this is a survey taken from May 2014, uh, a set of, of Jews to the Temple Mount among the religious Zionist public. In favor, we have three quarters of the public. So something very dramatic has happened. And, uh, uh, and I will not go into it in detail, but what has happened is basically that the disengagement from Gaza, the withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, and the destruction of the Gush Katif, sorry, settlement uh, um, um, line there, uh, really shook up this public and broke down what maybe can, can be called the Cookies meta-narrative, the, the story that they were basically uh, uh, um, convinced of that the settlement in the occupied territories is a way to uh, forward the messianic process, and it is a deterministic way. It is one way. It is there is no uh, um, there is no going back, there is no withdrawal from any territory that the state of Israel has already occupied. And this, of course, has been broken a few times, the last time with the disengagement from Gaza, and this broke down the meta-narrative. So when this meta-narrative breaks down, different voices can be heard, voices either that were silenced before or new ones. And one of the new voices is the... Uh, enthusiasm for the Temple Mount and even for the Temple. What does this enthusiasm include? Well, this is from the same survey, again, 2014, 
What are the reasons on which to base oneself when it comes to Jews going up the Temple Mount? I mean, why, why go up the Temple Mount? So uh, I'm going from, top, from bottom to top. To witness the special site, it's almost 40%. A positive commandment and prayer at the site, almost 60%. A ride to will raise awareness about the temple and its meaning, again, almost 60%. And almost 100% of religious Zionists asked, said that it's the contribution to strengthening Israeli sovereignty in the holy place. So it's pretty obvious what is concerning, what, what are these people concerned about. But it's not only that. Something more is going on at the Temple Mount, something that this survey did not address at all. This is due to Glick. Glick is one of the prominent uh, activists for, for the Temple Mount, even for the Temple. He is now a, a member of Knesset, a member of parliament from the Likud party. And I want you to, to, to notice what he says about ascending the Temple Mount. This is where I go where I want to recharge my spiritual batteries. There I feel transparent before the Lord. I cleanse myself of all insult and anger, and I try to turn myself into a into a conduit for all his affluence. I feel every time that I start anew. What is he doing up the Temple Mount? It's not a mitzvah. <coughs> He's not raising awareness in the public for the Temple or the Temple Mount. And uh, it's even not about sovereignty, about Israeli sovereignty, about Israeli political power, the state of Israel's political power over the Temple Mount and against the Palestinians, etc., etc. What is this? This is some spiritual quest, some spiritual experience that Glick has when he is going to the Temple Mount. And this is what is interesting for him. This is why he goes there, among other things, but this is definitely a prominent reason. And not only Greek. There's a whole movement of women ascending the Temple Mount in groups. And I, I, over at the right bottom corner, that's a, that's a flyer, that's a sort of ad that they uh, have uh, uh, calling other women to come and ascend the Temple Mount with them. And this is a quote, a not Z from Afra, member of Mahona Mikdash, it's one of the groups who, who, who are preparing themselves from the, for the next temple. Uh, one of the organizers of these ascensions, of women ascensions to the Temple Mount say, there is a strong feeling that the divine presence is lonely, but a group of women is powerful. Women are seemingly more delicate, but they feel things more deeply. And indeed, SK, one of the participants, says that this is an amazing experience, a prayer like you will not experience anywhere else. I call women, women to come to the Temple Mount and experience this extraordinarily powerful prayer. You feel you are connected to God. You feel his presence immediately, like the moment you connect an electrical plug. Again, this is a, a, a certainly a, a different kind of ascension to the Temple Mount. It is not an ascension in order, definitely not in order to uh, sacrifice some lamb on the altar, but also not to engage in any mitzvah, in any formal halachic decree that you are uh, prescribed to, um, to conduct. This is a, 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 a engaging in a spiritual quest. And another quote, it is there that the Shekhinah was present. Until this time, there is a holiness there that is greater than you'll find in, any, in all other parts of the land. I want to encounter that. And this is from, uh, ah, and, and another quote, the Holy of Holies is the bedroom of God and the people of Israel. So that's where you go when you're in love, I guess. Right? Now, what we see here is a different kind of sacred, a different kind of holiness, a different definition of what is the holy. Look at this uh, uh, quote from one of these women who ascend the Temple Mount. The rabbis are afraid of intimacy. They are afraid of holiness, kedusha. 
So holiness here is equated with intimacy. Quite the opposite than the usual classical definition of the holy as the far removed, the forbidden, the, w that which we have to uh, refrain from. And indeed, if at first, at before we saw Durkheim's definition of the holy, this is something much more closer to Rudolf Otto's definition of the holy in his famous book, The Idea of the Holy. <coughs> He says, he has many definitions from it, for it around the book, but, but uh, they are all uh, uh, around this subject. Holy, or at least the equivalent words in Latin and Greek, in Semitic and other ancient languages, denote first and foremost only this surplus over the ethical element in religion. It will be our endeavor to suggest this unnamed something to the reader as far as we may, so that he himself feel it. There is no religion which Jesus does not live as the real innermost core, and without it, no religion would be worthy of the name. This is the holiness that you feel. This is something that you experience. And it is this holiness that has taken over for these women, and for you, the Gleek, and for others who ascend the Temple Mount, over the classic uh, traditional definition of holy. And I want to show... Uh, uh, one final quote. This is Rabbi Itai Elitzur. I'm sorry, I don't, we don't have, con I don't, I didn't put quotations mark uh, on, the, uh, on the beginning of the sentence, but it, it's a quote. And he says, one goes there for the sake of holiness, for being, clo for being close to God. But there is always a tension involved. On the one hand, there is the wish to connect to the holiness, and on the other, the obligation to guard the holiness. If we enter into a place that where the defiled by impurity of the dead are forbidden, we've desecrated it. We've lost all that we gained. So he, and even without knowing, without being aware of it, he is talking about two kinds of holiness in the same sentence. We want to be close, but we can't be too close. We can't desecrate. We want to connect to the holiness, but we have an obligation to guard the holiness. This is the paradox that uh, he is in. Finally, why is this holiness changing its meaning? First, I would say, obviously, the cultural, this is, of course, uh, conjectures, hypothesis. The cultural influence of the New Age spirituality and the contemporary quest for religious experience as an exclusive point of religious truth, right? The New Age, contemporary spirituality, sees experience as a sign of authentic religiosity. I know that I'm close to God because I experience something, not because I uh, auto, uh, mechanically, technically ritual, uh, uh, perform a ritual correctly. And finally, another conjecture, the need to circumvent the transgression of the halakha, which is mediated by offering a parallel field of religious logic for the ascension to the mount. As I said, most all the great rabbis of the last hundred years have forbidden the ascension. Ascension is halachically not, not uh, definitely not consensual. It's, it's, it's debated and it's, it's, it's dangerous. So here is another angle of holiness in which you, by, of which you can hold and ascend the mound through another logic of religiousness. Thank you very much. Okay, just a minute. Okay. Ah. Yes. Right. Yes, please. C can you bring the mic, please? Uh, okay, you can start. We hear you. No. Yes. I, I'm looking up there. Yes. Yes, the lady. Okay. Professor something. <laughs> but I am. Uh, in many in many ways, I argue with him, and I don't agree with him in many ways. Uh, now, this last uh, quote that you have, the need to circumvent and parallel field of religious logic. I believe, and I'm a scholar of Jewish thought and uh, general philosophy of religion, etc. Um, 
I would say that in Judaism, and especially the revival we see in Halakha in the Middle Ages, and then the revival we see in Hasidut in uh, the 19th century, there has always been a quest for spirituality. There's always been a quest. It's very normal. That's why we talk about normal uh, mysticism. Now, I would like to say what is here <coughs> problematic is exactly this connection, and that's why I quoted uh, Schneeuer, connection between the return to the land, the, the, uh, the national element that is here in coming to the locus, we are at one time there were there were sacrifices, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and this quest to renew it or not to renew it, to renew it in some way, because you know, uh, even the Bruchim that went then to to right. to Babel, they came back and they said we don't want sacrifices anymore. And this is what I want to ask you about, because what was lacking for me in any case, you say halacha, but what's halacha really? But we would like, I would like to understand from you how you see this development. I mean, Sweet House says it's metaphysical, we have to wait, and, and the others say, no, we have to make it true today. And then there's a personal religious experience that people have. It's personal. And then, as a last question, I want to ask you, what about wait. Leviticus 19? Kedoshim to you. Question. What does that mean? Oh, okay. oh, I, I start Excuse from me. that. It's Kedoshim, a Kedoshim to you, Kedoshani, right? Oh. You shall be holy because I am holy, yeah. says God. What does that mean? You shall be a special de designated people upon earth as I am a special God in the heavens. That's what it means. You are special because I am special. I, we are unique. Not you, you, it's, it doesn't say you will be saints. Knows, God knows better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, now, now about the, about, I mean, the function of the ascension to the Temple Mount, I, I said a little bit, I think it's one of the results of the total breakdown of the Gushe Munim cookist worldview of the Zionist religious public. And one, one avenue that these energies that were there took is the ascension of the Temple Mount. What, what about the individual spiritual experience? Well, obviously, we are all, I mean, the whole of Israeli society has gone through a process of individualization. This is why we have a new age, a, a very lively new age scene in Israel, and, and the Zionist religious public is part of that. Thank you. Uh, Boaz? Thank you, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. So uh, Adam will be the last one, and you have minus one minute for it. Then I'm done. <laughs> no, but um, <laughs> a, a comment and a question. The comment is that uh, I, I'm not so sure that the definitions of Otto and Durkheim are uh, contradictory, or they describe two different things. They both kind of stem, in a sense, from the whole discussion of totem and taboo. And at the time, it was thought that taboo is completely for, as, and taboo was seen as a, as a general thing, not just okay. in the specific cultures that had the word that taboo is forbidden all the time, except when it's not. And when it's not, it's, which is usually a very specific time and place. And if you expand this, okay. then you can think even about the concepts of peak experiences, which is kind of a secular version, or a psychological secular version of the whole. It's, again, it's, a, it's unique because it's a peak experience. So it's usually forbidden, not always. I, I know it's not exactly the same as halakha, but I think that's an interesting thing. And the second thing is, how do you explain uh, uh, the, the dominance of the concept that people, sh that Jews should go up to the Temple Mount among the secular right-wing ministers and politicians mostly, and I'm guessing the public as well today? Is it the same explanation? That Miri Regev thinks it's, it's a good it's idea. It's no problem. I mean, I have explicit quotes of, of Miri Regev or Tzipi Chotobeli, of uh, Edelstein, of uh, MPs and, and, and ministers that say explicitly this is about sovereignty. We have to assert Israel's sovereignty on the Temple Mount. Nothing religious. I mean, even Tzipi Chotobeli, who is a religious person, it's, it's very clear. They don't mean to maybe say it so explicitly, but it's right there. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>